Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the most useful and practical books in all the scripture for living a praiseworthy life, understanding how to praise God, worship Him, how to approach Him in prayer. The book I'm referring to is the book of Psalms. Not only do we praise God through the book of Psalms, but many different aspects of worship we learn from this book. It is applicable for our life in every circumstance and situation. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and let's look this evening at Psalm 16. The book of Psalms and Psalm number 16. Now, we're going to encounter something that's unique. I believe the first time that we've encountered this term in a description of a psalm. In Psalm 16, as we look at the very first verse, it says in Hebrew, Michtam le David. Now, this is what we've been referring to as an inscription. It gives insight. It provides sometimes a context for understanding what was going on, for example, in the life of David. That, that led him to go before God, seek him, and receive inspiration for writing down a particular psalm. But here we don't know the circumstances, the situation, what was going on in his life. No, here it's simply a term, and most English Bibles leave it untranslated. It appears as part of the first verse in the Hebrew text. And look at that word again. It says, Michtam. Now, this comes from a Hebrew word that relates to a fine gold, a gold that surpasses that which is typical or normal. Now, this same word, the word ketem, derives from this word. Katim in Hebrew is a stain. And here's the correlation between these two words. You might say, how can the word stain and a word, that same word, mean a fine gold? Well, here's the correlation. If you're wearing, for example, a white shirt and it gets a hideous stain upon it, you spill something. And that stain stands out. And in that same way, this gold, this type of excellent gold, it stands out. It surpasses. So whenever we come to a song of David that is called a michtam, it stands out. We might say in English that it's a gem of a psalm. It is unique, and this one certainly teaches us much about walking with God, having the right mindset, the right perspective, in order once again to live a praiseworthy life before Him. So let's begin. Psalm 16 and verse 1. Michtam le David, a gem of a psalm that was written by David. And then he goes on and says, Guard me, O God. And this is a word for keeping, watching over. David's going to reveal to us principles that brings God into our life and causes us to be not only under his authority, but because we're under his authority, we can expect God's supervision 
his providence to be upon us. So he says, guard me, O God, for I, and here's the key, I have taken refuge. It is a word for trusting in. And these two things go hand in hand. It is when we trust God, rely upon him, depend upon him, that that faith brings us into a safe place, a refuge with God. So he says, I have trusted in you or I have taken refuge in you. Verse 2, you have said to the Lord, the Lord you. Now that may seem odd, but what it's saying here is this. David is speaking and he's speaking about himself. That, that you have said that you, O oh God, are everything. That's the implication. David realizes that nothing should be thought of as separate or unrelated to God. This is a false. Everything is related to God. Everything that happens, he wants to be involved in it. Even when we are in disobedience, God wants to be there to lead us to repentance. God wants to teach us or discipline us so we, we regain the right perspective, that we walk in obedience, guided by faith, being mediated to us by truth. Now, what does that mean? Well, to walk by faith, we have to be pursuing and recipients of the truth of God. So truth mediates faith. If you don't know the truth of God, you can't be in faith before him. So in this passage of scripture, he says, you have said to the Lord, Lord, you, meaning you are everything. My goodness, and this word for goodness, is also related to the will of God. It's what I say so frequently, and that is this. It is only when you are in his will, then you can expect his goodness to be, to be provided to you. And he says, my goodness, meaning because he has attached everything to God, that he sees God's uh, uh, superiority, and God's uh, rule over all things. Therefore, David wants to behave in every aspect of his life, recognizing God's sovereignty in every situation. So he says, my goodness, he says, is only from you. Everything that's good, being able to be in the will of God is an outcome of God moving me there revealing to me what his will is. So he says, the goodness which relates to his will is only from you. So over and over, we see how God is connected to all things, everything that happens in our life. If God's not the cause of it, and let me give you an example. When I disobey God, when one sins, God's not connected to that. God does not tempt us to sin. He is not an architect of anything outside his will, but even when we have sinned, God does not want to sever his relationship with us and wash his hands from us. God wants to lead us to repentance, bring us back to him, to, to renew this relationship with him. So verse three, to the saints, which is in the land, they are. Now, he's affirming that in the land, there are, and this makes it emphatic, there are saints. What are saints? Now, we need to understand this from two vantage points. You normally today, as New Covenant believers, followers of Messiah, those who have received the Gospels, we think of saints who are those who have been saved by God's grace, who have received the gospel. They are the saints, and the new covenant makes that very clear. But as I've said, the term saint 
which is simply the word holy ones. It's related to the purposes of God. So the saints are the ones in the land that they are carrying out, they are committed to the purposes of God. And then notice how the the verse concludes. He says, and this is parallelism, we see that a lot in this psalm. He's going to say, those who are committed to the purposes of God, they are mighty. Now, this word mighty also has a degree of splendor attached to it. They are the mighty ones, and all my delight is in them, meaning this. I want to be one of them. David is saying, I want, as I approach God in prayer, as I come before him in worship, this is my objective. I realize that 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 which is good is his will. And I realize that it's only when I am committed as the saints are to the purposes of God, then and only then is God going to supply, and notice the parallelism, there's a connection between the saints and mighty ones. The holy ones are strong ones. Why? Because they're committed to God's purposes and God supplies power. And that's why we see in the second part of this verse that David says, all my desire. This is a strong word for desire, chafetz. All my desire is in them. He wants to be like them. Verse 4. In verse 4, he's going to show a dichotomy. How that perspective that David has, how the saints live, what they pursue, what David desires, how different that is. And it's only when you really pour over the original language, in this case Hebrew, that you see some very interesting things. If we look now to to verse 4, they multiply, and this word can be the word for idols. So they multiply idols, but this same root can be related to sadness or grief. And what's the message? The message is very clear. When I pursue idolatry, when I turn away from truth and embrace the desires of a uncircumcised heart, a heart that has not been established, one that has not experienced regeneration through a salvation experience, when that is the case and I pursue idolatrous behavior, It is going to multiply sadness in my life. And then he goes on in speaking about this. He says, acher. Acher means another. And here it's a word that's related to, as well, idolatry. We talk about el acher, an other God. And if it's an other God, it's no God whatsoever. So this is speaking about those who are pursuing idolatry that goes after, and here's the key, quickly. They go quickly with speed after another God. Verse 4, David is saying, even though many do that, he says, I will not offer up a libation, their libation, from blood. Now, blood is important biblically. We know that the altar, that sacrificial service of worship that took place in the tabernacle and then afterwards in the temple, blood was foundational. But blood was appropriated properly. There's a very well-known pastor in California and and he gets it wrong when he speaks about blood. He speaks about the sacrificial service, and he says that it was like a slaughterhouse. Well, in a slaughterhouse, they simply want to get their work done. The blood is not of importance to them. And blood is is scattered all about. Not so in the temple. The blood was always handled in a very precise manner. 
We see that throughout the Torah. So when someone says that the, the temple service was like a slaughterhouse, that, that they were up into their ankles in blood, that is false. We do not see that in the scripture, and we don't see it in the description of Judaism from a variety of authoritative sources concerning the temple service. No, we see everything was done very orderly and the blood was handled in a proper, in a scripturally sound way. But we also know that the enemy, remember we're talking about idolatry, they get things incorrect. And blood was misappropriate. It was misused. In fact, we know today that there is false religions and some drink blood, they, they handle blood incorrectly, they profane that which is, is very significant scripturally to God. So David is saying here, look carefully. David says, I will not offer up their libations from blood, nor will I lift up their names, what names? These names of other gods, false gods, upon my lips. So David is chasing himself and makes a proclamation that he will not be part of anything related to idolatry. Meaning this, he's not going to be about his will, but rather the purposes of God. Learn an important biblical truth. When I pursue my objectives, rather than hearing from God what his objectives are and pursuing them, it's only when I pray, God, put in my heart your desires. Then we pursue that which is pleasing to God, that which is glorifying to God, that which is related to the purposes of God. But when I go after my will, it leads to idolatry. It leads to a connection to idolatry, false gods, demonic influence. So David says, I will not lift up upon my lips their names, these names of, of idolatry. Verse 5. Why doesn't he do that? He's made a commitment. He says, Lord, and it's talking about that sacred name, the Lord, he is the portion of, of my, my portion. It's two different Hebrew words that relate to a portion. So he's saying, my portion is the Lord. He is my portion and my cup. Now, the word cup here is related as well to a portion but here's the key. When the word cup, one of the prayers that is so common within the Jewish tradition talks about the cup of abundant salvation or the cup that, that overflows. And what David's teaching is this. When we make God the priority of our life, when his portion is our portion, then we can expect God to move in an abundant way. Secondly, he says, you, referring to God, you, you tomich gorali, you support. And the word goral, here it's gorali, my, and the poor, emphasis here is on the word for, word for future. Now, the important truth here is that God has a future for you and for me. And it's only when we make him our portion. Now, I was studying, and this idea of God being my portion means simply that I'm pursuing him. I want him to work mightily, my cup, work mightily in an abundant fashion in my life. And when that's the case, what's going to be the outcome of that? Very simply, we can expect God to, to support our future verse 6 now verse 6 begins with a unique word it's the hebrew word chavalim 
And there's, there's many ways that we can speak or understand this word. But in the scripture, we see that this word can be speaking about a region or a domain. It's also the Hebrew word for a rope. And there's other uh, definitions that, that we could bring in that are not really relevant here. But in the scripture, we see it being used as, as regarding a, a domain, a portion. It's, it's symbolically related to what we've studied. And he's saying here, my, and the reason why we can know how to translate it when it's kind of a difficult word is when we go and look at the next part of this verse. Remember, parallelism. You can learn a lot by understanding parallelism. What's parallel to this? Well, it's the word nachala. Nachala is an inheritance. So here it's speaking about a possession, an inheritance, a portion. And he says, basically, and it's in the plural, which is an encouragement. God's portions, his inheritances to us are going to fall. And it says, falls upon me, falls upon David in pleasant ways. Then he says, surely the portion, and it uses word, it's the same root for shofar. What is shofar, that ram's horn? What does it speak of? God's provision. So this verse is saying that David has confidence. David has confidence that he is going to be an inheritor, an heir of, of God's portion, the portion that God has for him. Now, we use the word domain, but it's those things that have been proportion that belong to God's purposes and that David's going to receive them. They're going to fall to him in pleasantness and, and surely the inheritance. And here's God's provision is unto me. So what this is simply say, saying is this, that David is going to be a recipient of that which God has for him. And isn't that what we should want? We should want what God has for us. Don't be pursuing what you think's best for you, what pleases your flesh, that, that gives you what you think you have coming to you, what your destiny is. No and no. Be someone who waits upon the Lord to be a recipient of his portion for you. What he has provided, this is what you will inherit it. Verse 7. Now, as an outcome of that, what is our response? He says, I will bless the Lord who, and I love this, who will counsel me. Now, here again, we see another important principle. David is teaching us this. When I hope my desire is in what God has for me, his will for my life, his purpose for me. When this is my desire, this is my pursuit, when I am committed to this, God is going to move. I will become a recipient and heir of that, and that is going to lead me to bless God. And what else does he say? He who will counsel me. Here's the principle. When I pursue my will, God will be silent. And if I hear anything, it's going to be demonic lies. Just that simple. Now, I realize many people, when I get emails, you talk about demons too much. No, the Bible speaks about demons a great deal in the Gospels. Messiah did. And what we find David revealing to us is this. When we pursue the things of God, God will counsel us. He will give us insight. He will give us guidance for our life. But when we pursue our own purposes, we open ourselves up to be deceived. And who's deceiving us? Well, we have that deceiver, that diabolical one, the devil or Satan. Same one. And oftentimes, it is his servants, demons, that carry out 
his purposes. So I will bless the Lord who will counsel me. And then he says, surely, or even, and it's a word, leilot. What's that? Nights. So in the night, what does God do? God does something. He, and this is a word, some will say discipline, and that's fine. But it's also the same root for the word, well, what we get ethics or morality from. Now, that is a discipline. We are disciplined to be ethical people, to be moral people. And what God is saying here in this psalm from David's writing, look at it again. He says, in the nighttime, isn't it marvelous and wonderful that God can work spiritually in you while you sleep? The one who keeps you never slumbers nor sleeps. So in the nighttime, surely in the nighttime or even in the nighttime, what does God do? God will, and it's a word, kiliotai. It's, we would translate kidneys, but in the Bible, the word kidney has a much greater significance. We're not talking about organs in the physical sense, but, but the word kidney, kliot, biblically speaking, and traditionally within Hasidic Judaism, speaks about a, a seat of wisdom, a stronghold of knowledge. So God is going to counsel us, and in the night, he is going to move to impart to us that which is ethical, that which is moral, and of course, from his vantage point. Without his ministry, his workmanship, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit edifying us, we won't know that which is ethical and moral from God's standpoint. Verse, verse 8. Shiviti Adonai le nagdi temid, which means I cried out to the Lord before me, meaning he's before me continuously. Or he who is before me, I cry out to him continuously. Now, this can also, the word negdi can be before, but also those who are against me. So it can be understood, I cry out to the Lord because of those who are against me. How often do I cry out? All the time. So, shiviti Adonai le negdi to me. For my right hand will not uh, uh, stumble or collapse, will not be moved. And here it is, this word right hand can relate to that which is the seat of integrity. And it's integrity. See, Messiah, he can be thought of as the right hand. He sits on the right hand of God, but many places in the scripture, speaks about the right hand of the Lord. And, and that right hand accomplished majestic things. And some see it as a reference to the work of Messiah. Well, here what it's saying is simply this. Look carefully. As I cry out continuously to the Lord who is before me, meaning we translate it the traditional way, I am following him. I am constantly following him. Therefore, because I am pursuing God, I now have the privilege of calling out in a way. And because of that, my integrity will not cease. It will not uh, collapse. I will not grow uh, despondent in doing good, wary in pursuing the will of God. Verse 9, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices now in the scripture we see something remember heart and we see the term glory heart how is it related to glory very simply we need to think upon the things that are glorious to god and when we do the outcome is going to be joy and gladness we need, and that which is glorious, it comes from the word for heavy 
or a substance or significance. So meditate. Make your thoughts that which is significant, that which has substance from God's standpoint, that which is glorious to Him. And when you do, that is going to produce joy and gladness in your life. And it says, then my flesh, it will dwell for safety. When I pursue that which is glorious to God, I will have joy and I can be assured of his defense, his security. This word safety can also be understood as security. This same word in modern Hebrew relates to insurance. So here's how we can think of it. When I think according to that which is glorious to God's perspective, the outcome is going to be joy and gladness. That's great, but also it is a form of spiritual insurance for my life that God steps up to be my defense. Verse 10. Now, verse 10 is a messianic prophecy. We see that for, if I'm not mistaken, in the book of Acts chapter 2, and I believe verse 27, where, where Peter is preaching and he's speaking about Messiah. And we read that, let's just read this scripture, for you will not abandon my soul in Sheol. What it's speaking about is that Messiah, now he has the power, and he did to lay down his life, he has the power to take it up again. But so often I speak about the fact that the word of God says that God raised him from the dead. And I'm not going to go in again on the theological significance of that, but it's relating to trust. That Messiah, and I need to talk about a term just for a moment, because previously, if you would go back uh, before 10, 15 years ago, and you use the, the theological term kenosis. It's simply speaking about Messiah emptying himself, and it's a, a synonym for humbling himself. Emptying himself of all that he desired in the body in order that he would obey his Father's will. It does not speak about him ceasing to be divine. Him ceasing to be the Son of God. So he did not empty himself of his divinity. He is eternally divine. There was never a time that Messiah did not exist. There was never a time that he wasn't divine, both in eternity past and eternity future. But the kenosis speaks about him humbling, him emptying himself of all things in order to fulfill the purposes of God. The best example of this is found in, well, it's mentioned in Philippians 2, the basis for it, but in the garden. When Messiah says, not my way, but your way. And this your way, O oh God, is what it's speaking about here. And what did he do? He chose to go to the cross to humble himself even to death and death on a cross. That's what it says in Philippians chapter 2. So he died and he did not operate in his own power. He could have. He never ceased having that power, but he didn't utilize it. And it says here, for you will not abandon my, my soul in Sheol, that is the place of dead, nor will you give your, and it's the word chassid. It's from the word grace, but here it's one that gives grace. So it may be translated a variety of ways. Here in my Hebrew Bible, it shows it in the, the plural. My uh, holy ones, I think some translate it. My uh, uh, pious ones, depending upon how your Bible does. But I have a correction here that says, if you look at the bottom, that it shouldn't be. In the plural, it's singular. And that tells us that it's speaking about not in a general sense, but a specific sense, speaking about Messiah. That, that you will not uh, uh, allow your, your gracious one, the one who 
gives grace to see destruction. Messiah did not find any type of destruction while he was in Sheol. Verse 12, our last verse. Todiani orach chayim. Now, todiani means inform me. I realize that different English translations have different words, but it's a word for inform me, to make known. It's the same word for an announcement. So make known to me orach chayim. What's orach chayim? The pathways of life. The way to travel, the proper direction, the right road to take. So make known to me the way of life. And when we are on that way, notice what he says. We have the word sava. Sava is a word for being satisfied. It's the same word that we see in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 where it says, when you have eaten your food and are satisfied. When you have eaten and satisfied. And God is going to satisfy us with, and the next word is gladness, but in the plural. Those things that make us glad. And what is going to be the chief? What is going to satisfy us and make us glad in an abundant way? What well, tells us? One thing. Your presence. Now, it's et panecha. He says here, basically, your abundant gladness satisfies me, and it satisfies me with your presence. Now, the word face can mean the blessing, and the blessing they're speaking about is once more being in the presence of God. And then he says, and we'll wrap up, Naimot, pleasant. Pleasant is your right hand. This may be a reference to Messiah. Pleasant. And it's once more in the plural. It's synonym for those things that make us glad abundantly. He says it's Messiah, your right hand, that brings about abundant pleasure. And how often is this abundant pleasure? Well, many see this as a kingdom experience because the last word, here's the word, Netzach, and Netzach is forever. But let me close with this. And this is why it's so important to, to understand the biblical language and invest in word studies. Properly studying the word of God, the most important commodity is time. And the word Netzach, Forever also comes from the word nitzachon, which is victory. And that's why this is a kingdom expression. It speaks about an eternal victory. And that victory is an outcome of the work of Messiah, the right hand of the Lord, who is going to bring about that which is pleasant, and it's an abundant pleasantness forever and ever. Yes, in my opinion, this 16th Psalm is truly a, a gem. The more you study it, the more you understand it, the more you apply it to your life, you will find that you will experience to a greater degree joy, gladness, and God's presence in your life and His leadership through His presence to bring you into His will so that you can fulfill his purposes and be someone who is indeed living a praiseworthy life. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.